I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. No one Amen. Amen. Good singing, good singing. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. The title of this message is going to be Dead Flies. Dead Flies. There in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I'll begin by reading the entire chapter. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he is a fool. If the spirit of a ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses, and princes walking as servants upon the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more strength, put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. Amen. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him who can tell him. The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season, for strength and not for drunkenness. By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and, th and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. Here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, we're continuing on in our study. Um, we just got through uh, Solomon of understanding, giving understanding to the idea of wisdom, uh, beginning with obeying authorities and how that applies to your life. And then, especially, he enforced the idea of yoking up with the Lord in your works and allowing the Lord to lead the works that you're doing and trying to take joy in and trying to seek joyfulness within these works. This same wisdom, then, we see is stronger than weapons of war. 
and it can overcome many obstacles. But wisdom is best served when it's in the hand of the Lord. So we need to be wise in our lives. We need to do the best that we can to be of a man of wisdom, a woman of wisdom. But ultimately, in the end, we are trusting the Lord with the outcome in all situations, right? Because even, even the wise men sometimes falls, right? Even the fool sometimes makes gain in this life. And it's all according to God's eventual and master plan that will come to fruition. Though it doesn't always happen in our own timeline or in our own understanding. We don't often see it. So here in verse 1, he begins by saying, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So there's a word there, the apothecary, one that we may have difficulty understanding. These people were ones that would make healing potions, let's say for lack of a better term. Um, just as we would take different uh, essential oils and put them together to make a healing balm, uh, the apothecary was, was the same. It was a natural form of medicine. It eventually evolved into what we have now where it's just pharmaceutical weirdos mixing all sorts of drugs and creating mystical potions that will do you more harm than good in most situations. But the apothecary generally was one that would take natural elements, mix them together to create healing uh, nectars, healing bombs, healing things to to take for yourself. But here, the apothecary, as he's making it, this truth comes to fruition and explains uh, the, the motif of this whole chapter, essentially, that, that though he would make a great, um, a great mixture that would do great works and would heal and would smell nice, as, as any of us who have ever played with those, uh, those essential oils would know, quite often a good smell, a good aroma would come off of these things. The Bible says here that dead flies make that same ointment to have a stinking savor, an unpleasant odor, a, a, a disgusting, a putrid odor comes off of it as the dead flies fall within that. And, and simple, uh, the apothecary, he wouldn't be making generally a, a small dose, he would probably be making a large vat. So we see that even a few dead flies here causes a great stink to come out of even a great big that. So little dead flies in much ointment will still bring forth that same stinking savor. And in comparison, it takes them the dead flies and says, the dead flies and says, so doth a little folly. So then liking the dead flies to the folly here, so doth a little folly that is in him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So if the man of reputation for wisdom and honor was that great big fat of a lovely smelling um, Ball, a lovely smelling type of healing nectar or, or a great big oil that would be used to heal people was that person that was wise and that person that was held in honor just as a little fly would cause it all to stink so doth a little folly cause that same man of wisdom and reputation to stink before the world so we need to be wise and we also need to be mindful that if a little folly gets into your life and it gets heard um, that's going to cause a great taint to your reputation though you've done well 99 times you get Get caught with folly that one time and immediately your honorable and wise status falls to nothing and it stinks you stink in the eyes of others this is why we need to be so careful to guard our reputation our reputation as a Christian is 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 our testimony this is what draws people to us and gives us um, more power when we go with to preach the gospel, especially among people that we know. It's easy to go to a stranger, knock on their door. They don't know you from Adam. That's you right. preach them the gospel, and they'll say, this was a good man. He had a tie on. He looked good. He smelled good. He was very polite, right? But it's not the same when you go to somebody who's known you since you were just a little child. Maybe you were saved when you were 20, 30, however the age may be, and they've known you all your life. You go to that same person, and they know all your faults. They know all your sins. They know all your wrongs. They know everything about you, and so to go with that same... Um, testimony before you is, is difficult. And that's where we really need a strong testimony. If you were a wicked, heathen person before 25, like I was, uh, and they saw a change and then you preach Christ to them, that's going to do so much more for you. If you're showing that, that wisdom, if you're showing that honorable stance as a Christian, and that you have made a firm change at some point of your life, that's going to go a long way for your testimony. But at the same time, you can carry a testimony for 10 years of being a good, an honorable, a wise, and righteous Christian and ruin it with one act of foolishness, one act of folly. 
take all of that and make it to stink before the eyes of the world. We need to be careful to guard those things. And among other things we need to guard is our heart. Verse 2 says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left hand. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We're to keep our heart, we're to guard our heart, we're to maintain our heart in close confines, away, separate, and, and restricted from what around it would cover it, would touch it. The right hand here is, is, a, is a type of strength. If you were to go to Genesis chapter 48 quickly, keep your finger in Ecclesiastes. And in Genesis chapter 48, we're going to see the idea of strength and what it means to have that right hand of strength. Where you're to actually keep your heart. Genesis 48 and verse 17. The Bible says Genesis 48 and verse 17. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. So then the right hand of the father in giving the inheritance, giving the blessing, was placed particularly on the one that would be greater, signifying the strength was in the right hand. And even so, Joseph, though he was displeased, saw that Ephraim was the one that was set before because the right hand of the father was placed upon him. The right hand of his grandfather was placed upon Ephraim. Uh, the next passage that we see is Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15, you'll see a similar effect in the Song of Moses. Talking about God's right hand, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 6 says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And over in verse 12, it says, Likewise, thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed him. So God is showing that his right hand is where strength is. Moses sings unto him that his right hand is what has great power. His right hand dashes into pieces the enemy. His right hand is what reduces them to nil as the earth swallows them up. The right hand is the strength of God. Bible also says that in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And again, if you were to keep reading, you can go to Exodus chapter 29, you'd find the command. And you find in Leviticus chapter 8, the action go into place where the priest was anointed. And when they did so, they placed blood upon the tip of the right ear and blood upon the right hand and blood upon the tip of the right toe, all signifying that strength came from that place. We have a story in the Bible where uh, a man was able to get close to a king and kill him. I'm reading the passage at the moment. But it was because he was a left-handed man. And whenever somebody would come towards a king, obviously they would want to disarm him. They would check at his left hand. Why? Because that's where he would draw his sword out. They saw a left hand, no weapon, right? But this man was a left-handed uh, left person, so he was able to take that sword and strike it through his enemy. It's always the right hand that's given it strength. The left hand is abnormal. And sorry to any of lefties out there, but <laughs> that's just the truth. That's just what the Bible says. The right hand is where strength is, and it's there forevermore in the Lord, according to the Bible. So then, back in Ecclesiastes, chapter 10 and verse 2, a wise man's heart then is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. So therefore, with the heart placed in that position of strength, we are giving particular focus to it. We are giving a signification of protection to it. It's going to be where the, the, the focus of a man is, where the strength of a man is. In other words, you're to guard your heart with your right hand. Put most of the focus upon that because that is your very being. That is your very strength. If you don't do this, if you don't guard your heart with the right hand, well, then you're as the fool that keeps it by his left, keeps it vulnerable, keeps it in a place of weakness, a place where there's not much authority given. It's not restricted. It's not restrained. It's not controlled. Uh, verse 3 says, um, Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. So the fool here by his works, the fool here by his walk, as he goes about trying to walk in the way, is constantly basically just saying the words, I am a fool. 
I am a fool, I am a fool, I am a fool. And it's because of the way that he acts. It says here, his wisdom faileth him. He saith to everyone that he is a fool. I don't know the last time that you've actually seen a foolish person just walk up and say, I'm a fool, I'm a fool, I'm a fool, I'm a fool. They're not actually saying that with the words of their mouth, but they're saying it by the way they walk. They're saying it by the way they proceed in their own way. So then, in the same capacity, like we already talked about, the wise are known by their walk, the fool is known by his walk. And even the wisdom that the fool here seemeth to have, the Bible says that it fails them. This folly, this foolishness is the dead flies. This is the, this is the error of their way. This is the foolishness that they show. That though they would predominantly, perhaps, even the foolish man show himself wise, eventually it'll fail him. Why? Because his works are going to make manifest. The dead flies are going to fall into that perceived wisdom, and it's all going to stink. It's going to fail him. Verse 4 continues this idea. We can talk about uh, the spirit of the ruler. It says here, If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offense. So I don't think that that little tale about the apothecary is something that we just restrict from the context, and this is just kind of thoughts that Solomon's throwing out. But at times when my study, I started to think it was, because a lot of these ideas are a little bit disjointed in my understanding. But again, what he's saying here is he's trying to limit the dead flies falling into the ointment. As a born-again child of God, you are that wonderful ointment. You are that wonderful healing balm. The Holy Spirit lives and resides inside of you, and it's our idea, it's our desire to keep those stinking flies out, to keep that folly out of what would be a wise and honorable life that we're trying to live. So then here, it plays into the same context where uh, Solomon's going to start explaining again the context of serving under under a ruler, how you would avoid the dead flies, how you would avoid the little bit of folly. And here he says in verse 4, if the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. And so then you see that the dead flies, that the folly would have been to leave thy place. But what is right and what is good and what is wise and what is honorable is that you would yield and pacify, therefore, great offenses. So the heated ruler could be this. It could be your boss. It could be your parents, children. Wives, it could be your husband, right? Who's ever in lordship over you, according to the Bible. Who's ever your authority. And then we see here that rather than leaving the place of the spirited ruler that has rised up, the spirit of the ruler that has rised up in opposition against thee. The Bible says here, don't leave, don't quit, don't walk away. It says yield to it. Why? Because this pacifieth, this brings peace, this calms a situation more than yourself being, ha having the spirit of your authority rise up against you and you just walk away. You, you, are, you are doing folly by doing that. I've, I've had these situations at work where my boss is, has, has all, like I said, all short of just, just calling me like, what are you thinking? I pay you to think. Like, give your head a shake. Like, like he's, he's super mad. He, he's hot. His spirit has rised up against me. And the wrong thing to do, the folly to do, would have been for me to just turn and walk away from it. Rather, I just stood my ground and in the end yielded to whatever he had to say at that moment and thereby pacifieth great offenses. I brought a peace to the situation. I brought a calm to the situation by simply yielding, saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, and taking it, even if he's wrong, even if I feel he's wrong, even if it's bothering me that he's saying these things to me, just take it. And this is a great opportunity for ministry. Why? Because as that healing bomb, what are you doing? You are allowing for the ministry of the Spirit to go upon him. You've taken the situation, and instead of fleeing from it, you have then ministered unto your authority that is coming down upon you, heated up in anger at that situation. You've applied that healing balm, and all you had to do was stand there, yield yourself, bring that peace, bring that pacifying uh, need to the situation, calm the situation. And this is what he's saying here. He's saying, hey, don't leave thy place just yield to it. Just, just take what the boss, take what the husband, take what the parents are saying and, and receive it. Verse 5 says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an heir which proceedeth from the ruler. So we know then that because the Bible records it, not just from our own experience, that often rulers 
make mistakes. There is an error that proceedeth from the ruler. They are never perfect. They are not perfect. So then the Bible here records it. We can believe it, and we can even experience that in our own situations. So we're all like, yeah, of course, my boss always makes mistakes. right? We get all puffed up against that. But the truth is, yes, they do. But when he does, verse 6 says, folly is set. So here's one of the errors that proceeds from the ruler. He's going to start explaining this. He says, Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in a low place. So then folly, which is that foolishness, it's that lack of sense, is placed in a state of worth or in a state of respect even among rulers. And we've seen that where the guy that doesn't deserve it gets promoted. And we're all like, what in the world? He's been placed in that position of great dignity. The rich then here, it says, sit in a low place. And perhaps these are rich that are relative to the ruler. Perhaps these are rich in spirit. I don't know. But this Bible seems to record that there is some sort of error in these statements. Folly set in dignity. Rich sitting in a low place. And in verse 7 it says, I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. So again, that, there's another folly that we see. An error that proceeded from the ruler is that people are often not in the same position that would be indicative of their prestige. In other words, you would think that it would be the yeah. prince rocking on the horse. You would think that it would be the prince not walking about on the earth on his own, but rather that's the servant's place. And yet those roles often change. Those roles often are switched. And often in a workplace, you'll see sometimes that a lack of vision will sometimes put the medical doctor mopping the floor. You see that all the time where a guy that's super qualified to do this job, and we have an opening in this job, he's over here mopping the floor. Why? Because the ruler hath made an error. He hath not been... Uh, had enough sight to see that there was a great need for that somebody within his own organization should feel, should be able to fill. But the, the truth remains the same, that though there is error proceeding from the ruler, yielding all the same is best in every situation. So go with it. Just yield yourself. Sometimes you're going to get the bum rap. Sometimes you're going to want the promotion. It doesn't go to you. It goes to somebody that's a fool. He's set in great dignity before you. You just, you just got to roll with it. You just got to take those situations. And like, like Ecclesiastes keeps always saying, just find joy in the job you're given, joy in the job you're doing, do it the best of your ability, and just let God sort out the rest. Just let Amen. God have control Amen. in those Amen. situations. Because that is the bottom line of this life. It's all we can hope to do. If we go about fussing and kicking and meddling and striving and worrying about our position, worrying about our next steps, worrying about everything, we're just going to live a miserable life. And that's contrary to what God wants for us. So then peace then, even in the situation of standing before a ruler, is not allowing for yourself to be meddling in other matters. You need to stir up, and girls, 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 peace is not meddling with others. It's not allowing for what it says in verse 8. He that Diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Okay, so we just started talking about different things that you see in a situation where you're under a ruler, and there's these great evils that come, errors that proceed from of them, where the opposite would be in every case. And I said that we're to yield to it, we're to just accept it, and to roll with it, and to do the best we can in the situation that we are in. Verse 8 then talks about this, talks about digging a pit. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. So what it's saying here is that if you were to then get involved in these situations and try to change and try to manipulate them and try to, like it says, dig a pit, or try to, like it says, break an hedge, don't be shocked when the ground falls out beneath you and you fall therein. Don't be shocked when you get bitten, right? Because... We're seeing all sorts of people perhaps getting promoted above us and it's upsetting us. God's order is to just yield to it, let it happen, and allow for him to open up, you know, because promotion cometh from the north, right? Mm -hmm. Let him open up the, the situation where that you can get promoted, you can get moved forward in your life, you can advance in your life, let him do it. But it says here, and it's, this is a stern warning to the contrary part, where he that diggeth a pit, in other words, if you're going to dig a pit, you're going to try to move dirt and change your circumstances, you might fall into it. If you're going to break up the hedge, you're going to try to provide another way, you're going to make a path through the hedge, don't be surprised if a serpent shall bite you. 
He that removeth the stones, in verse 9, shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. So therefore, moving the stones that are in your life, hey, they might hurt you. It's best to leave them alone. Clearing the wood, again, it's dangerous business. Sometimes, perhaps, it is best to leave them alone. Right? But we got to all keep these in the same context, right? Because if we're to look back to the beginning of Ecclesiastes, you're going to see statements like this. Hey, there's a time to dig a pit, and there's a time to not. There's a time to break a hedge, and there's a time to not. There's a time to remove stones, and there's a time to not. Every one of these situations, right, it gives you the leeway to act out your own free will. But we have to do it wisely. We have to do it smartly. We have to do it in the, rep, in the way of somebody that has a reputation for wisdom and honor. Because each one of these situations, right, you go and dig a pit. It may work out right for you. But if you fall into it, there is that dead fly that makes your reputation to stink. If you go and you break up a hedge, you may do it fine. You may provide another way for yourself. But if it falls short, you get bitten by the snake, there is a dead fly in the ointment of your life. And now you have that little folly that causes stink in your reputation that otherwise would have been one of wisdom and honor. So God says here, hey, don't go and digging up pits. Don't go and removing stones. Don't go and cleaving wood unless you're 100% sure that it is the right decision to make. And quite often I find in my life just yielding, allowing God to make the next step works out way better than if I go and I take that next step on my own. Verse 10 says, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more strength into it. But wisdom is profitable to direct. So that blade then upon the edge of the axe if that iron be blunt you got to put more strength in it it's just a picture of god being that axe i mean how the, the bible is is described as as an axe right um and and in that description it's saying that hey if it were to be blunt you're going to have to put more strength in it. In other words, if God hasn't prepared the next step for you, he hasn't given you the instrument to cut the wood. He hasn't provided the sharp edge in order to break through that piece of lumber, then you are going to have to put more of your own strength into it. And every time we put more of our own carnal strength and our abilities and our natural wherewithal into something, we end up getting into trouble. Why? Because... The Bible says that salvation is not by works for a reason, lest any man should boast. And even in our sanctification, in our walk, if we get to the point where we start to think that, hey, I'm, I'm really laying into this. I, my axe is driving right through that wood, and it's dull. And so you're putting all your strength and all your might into it. And you do get through that piece of lumber. You're going to go, ah, look what I did. You're going to puff yourself up. And the next time, instead of trusting God to wet that edge to sharpen that edge so that it drives through, you're just going to next time come in and just do it again. Same thing. You're just going to be constantly trying until eventually your axe is just a blunt instrument and it's going to get nowhere and get nothing. And you're going to be left in a situation that you didn't want to be in in the first place. You're going to be left digging a pit and falling into it. You're going to be left breaking a hedge, a serpent biting you. You're going to remove stones and be hurt. You're going to cleave wood and be endangered thereby. Because if you just keep on cleaving that wood, you keep on cleaving that wood, and your ass gets dollar and dollar and dollar because you're doing it in your own strength and in your own might, you will eventually get to the point where you can't cut a thing. Verse 10, it says then, if the arm be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. And wisdom then should be what is profitable. That is what is effective. That is what is best followed after to direct you to the decisions about whether or not you are going to break up the earth, whether or not you're going to break up the hedge, whether or not you're going to cleave the wood. Wisdom directs you through these circumstances. Therefore, as the principal thing, we need to get wisdom so that we can better decide whether it's a time for A or a time for B, whether it's a time for C or a time for D. We need to be able to navigate, and the only way we can do it is through the wisdom that God imparts unto us, always giving him the glory and allow him to the opportunity to direct the next steps. That's wisdom of all things, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? We need to seek after fearing him, and that way we can grow in wisdom. Verse 11 says, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. So we were talking about how there may be situations in the which when you see 
great folly proceeding or great error proceeding from the ruler, there may be times when you should dig a pit. There may be times where you should remove something. There may be times where you should essentially get involved. You should say something. You should do something. Well, verse 11 says, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment and a babbler is no better. So if you were to bring up this offense and seemingly without thought, you might get caught in that area whereby you're convinced of the world that you're a babbler yourself. Here's the situation. Something's not going right and I go to my boss and I haven't thought it through. But I know that everything's wrong in my heart and in my mind and I go to him and I say, I think this is wrong and this is wrong and that is wrong. And without enchantment, without provocation, just as the serpent, I begin to lay out my situation before him. If I'm not prepared, if I'm not prepared up, then I become a babbler just as that serpent that bites without enchantment. And I'm worse off for it. We need to be wise concerning these things, and harmless as doves. So, again, we need to ask ourselves in every area of life whereby there may be a controversy, whereby we may be confused about something, or we may be hurt, or things might not be going our way. We need to ask ourselves, are things going, quote, well enough that we are able to enjoy the fruits of our labor, that are we, we are able to be content where we're at. There's two things that are really important to the book of Ecclesiastes, and that's that we would enjoy the fruit of our labor and we'd be content to do it. And if what is going well enough is well enough and we're able to enjoy where we're at, we need to be content to stay there. And well is such, a, such an interesting term because sometimes things can be going poorly for us, but in fact we're very much in the, word of, the will of God. So ask yourself, before you go and break up the hedge, before you go and dig that pit, before you go and try to enact your own will in the situation because there's been a folly come from your authority and you want to go before them and question it and set it right and get your own will to be imposed on the situation, before you do that, again, can you just enjoy the fruit of your labor? Can you be content where you're at? Ask these things. Wisdom here then, as it says, evaluates the situation. Wisdom is profitable to direct you in these circumstances. You need to ask yourself whether or not it is it needful or expedient to dig that pit. Needful or expedient to break that hedge, remove the stone, cleave the wood. You need to do all this before you open your mouth to the ruler. See, foolishness, the dead flies in the ointment, is that snake that bites without enchantment. There was nothing to provoke it. There was nothing that, that drew it, that, that enchanted the snake to do the biting. The snakes just do their biting all on their own. And if you come before the ruler in that same way, just without enchantment and without provocation, you're no better than the babbler the Bible records here. Foolishness, dead flies in your ointment, something that is going to bring a stinking savor into your reputation, into your testimony, is exactly something like this, whereby you would bite at a ruler and you would do it in a foolish and unlearned and, and ignorant sense and it would cause you to have folly upon your own reputation. It is always best, it is always best to yield to God's control in any situation. To Amen. give God the ability to lead, as I always says, but sometimes, right, there's a time to Yield and just sit back and let God move in this situation. There's also a time where you need to take a step to enact your own will on that situation. And sometimes even you stepping out in that way is God's will in the end. If you do keep in mind that your heart is prone to folly, and if not kept, if you keep in mind that your heart needs to be placed in your right hand in full control and the strength and under submission to yourself, then you will have a better opportunity to control what your heart does. Well, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you haven't thought these things through, then don't go to the ruler. You're going to break up the hedge and fall into it. You're going to get bitten by a snake. You're going to have dead flies in your testimony. It's going to make you stink before the world. But if you've thought about it, if your heart is in control, if you are guided by the Spirit in this situation, there is a time, and it is the time, to dig that pit, remove those stones, and step out and show wisdom and honor before the ruler then go forth. When bringing a matter to a ruler, we need to be first peaceful. Verse 12 says, The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, 
but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. So we need to have a graciousness to our words, especially when we're going forth, going towards somebody, questioning somebody who is an authority over us. So the first I had was be gracious, but I changed it to peaceful because I'm going to have three Ps here. First, be peaceful. Give the benefit of the doubt to the leader. Give them the opportunity to explain. Give them the opportunity to correct you if you're wrong. Be gracious. Be peaceful in this situation. The next thing that you need to do when you're proceeding with breaking up a hedge or digging a pit in order to remove yourself from great offense or from great errors that a ruler has made is be pertinent. Verse 13 says, The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is is mischievous madness. So if you're not pertinent, if you're not to the point, if you're not guided, if you don't know how you're going to start, how you're going to end the conversation, you haven't thought it out that much, then you are going to end up, as it says, with the beginning of your mouth being foolishness before your authority, and the end of your talk is just mischievous madness. You're going to come to them with just foolishness, and you don't even know what your problem is. You're just upset. You know why your emotions are driving the situation. And by the end, it's just mischievous madness. It's just confusion. You're, you're stumbling over yourself. You haven't proved your point. You haven't explained to the authority in your life what is even the problem. And therefore, you end up with dead flies in the ointment. You end up with a stinking savor, though you once had the reputation for wisdom and honor before this authority. Verse 14. So we have, you have to be peaceful. You have to be pertinent. You have to be precise. Verse 14. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? So full of words is the next thing that a man does. A foolish man. Just full of words. So many words. Just running off his mouth. This way and that way. He, he came to this argument. He came to this discussion. He knew he had a problem with his ruler. And instead of being peaceful and pertinent and precise, knowing exactly what his problem was, exactly what he hoped the outcome would be, planned exactly how he would present it to his boss, he came off rather than peaceful, pertinent, and precise. He came off as a babbling fool. He came off as somebody who had mischievous madness. He came off as foolishness. And in the end, his own lips swallowed him up. He sullied his own reputation. <clears throat> More points of wisdom as we continue on. Verse 16 says, Woe unto thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. And so we see here that woe unto the nation that has inexperienced sluggers ruling over them. Indeed. And we know this even in the workplace. We've experienced that the best leaders quite often are the people that start at the bottom and work their way up. They're not placed in a position of authority right from the get-go. Rather, they have labored, they have toiled, they have worked, they have experienced all of the ways that happen from the bottom to the top, and they have grown in these situations. These are the best kinds of rulers. And so therefore, it only makes sense that there would be great woe when there's a child that is leading them, and when the princes eat in the morning. A child leading them, that, that makes sense. That is clear. A child doesn't know the left hand from the right hand. They don't know they're up from their down. And therefore, they're going to make wrong decisions all the time. Children are not made to be leaders. They're meant to be followers. The next thing we see, though, is that these young and inexperienced create in themselves this mentality of great laziness. Why? Because they eat breakfast in the morning. The Bible says in verse 16, it says that thy princes eat in the morning. This would not be good. This would be a woe upon that land. Why? Because the morning is the most profitable time of the day. And everyone's going to say, oh, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Sure. Getting up and getting a good breakfast, it may be to some people the most important meal of the day. But according to the Bible, the most important thing for the beginning of the day is not to eat in the morning, but to be diligent in the morning. Verse 17, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So at an appropriate time, they would eat, and they would eat for strength and not for drunkenness. So if the appropriate time for you then is to eat in the morning, that's great, that's fine and that good, but the most important thing should be diligence in the morning, focus in the morning, getting to work in the morning, and that's what these right leaders do. They're not slothful in their business, but rather the princes 
Eat in due season. It's for strength. It's not for drunkenness. It's not just because it feels good. It's not just because I enjoy that particular breakfast. It's, not, it's because they need it. They get up. They get to work. They do what they're supposed to do. And, as, and they do so because they've learned from the king before them. Right? The king is the son of nobles, the son of princes. They eat in due season. They do what is appropriate because they've learned and they have the experience to do so. Then you see that the wrong thing, the dead flies in the ointment, that folly would be to do the opposite, to, to be someone inexperienced, to be somebody that's just eating for drunkenness. And they rise to leadership, and that is great folly, and that is going to cause great folly to somebody that would have wisdom and reputation and honor, other words. Verse 18, by much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. So again there, we see in verse 19 that feasts have a specific purpose. We see then that wine has a specific purpose, but money answereth all things. So we need to appropriate what money would be used for and what it wouldn't be used for. It's not just appropriated to being merry like you find wine is. It's not just appropriated to laughter like you find the feast is. Money answereth all things, and therefore we need to use wisdom profitable to direct to tell us what to do with our money. The best thing we can do is with a reputation of wisdom and honor, allow God to lead us how we would spend our money, lest we should fall into folly and therefore sully our good reputation. And finally, verse 20, Curse not the king, no, not in thy thoughts, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. And so this is where we get that saying that people will say, where a little birdie told me something. A little birdie, right? It says, a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. So we need to be in great guard of what we're saying, even when we think it's something that we're saying in private. The thoughts and intents of our heart are clearly known by God. And if it be God's will to make the thoughts and intents of your heart to be exposed before others. Say you curse the king in your thoughts. Say you curse the rich in your bedchamber. And God wants that to be exposed. He will cause for your folly to be made manifest before all. That little birdie will tell of the thing. And perhaps somebody will overhear something that you've said in private. Perhaps somebody that you've told something to in confidence will reveal the matter. We need to be careful not to just have this outward show of wisdom and honor, but we need to understand that even the things that we do in private and in secret, at like as cursing the king, like as cursing the rich in our bedchamber, that we think might be something private and contained and no one would ever find out about it because we're doing it in secret, right? The things that we're watching on the television, the things that we're listening to in our bedchambers, all of these things that cause great folly to a man, but we keep it private and therefore before the world we're in reputation of wisdom and honor. Therefore before the world we're seen as somebody who is upright and morally righteous. But those things that are done in secret will be made manifest if God should, should so choose to do so. So we need to be aware of these things because God could take that little birdie and use it to expose the dead flies that you have in your closet. And they'll fall upon your reputation. And that which was supposed to be a good smell before the world. That which was supposed to be a light unto the world. That which was supposed to be a testimony that would glorify Christ will now have dead flies in it, and it'll stink, and you'll stink before the world, and it'll all be sullied. We need to be mindful of all of these things and appropriate wisdom. Use it to direct us, because wisdom is profitable to direct. That way we'll know when to make the decision to do X versus Y. We'll know when to do the right thing versus doing the wrong thing. And therefore, in as much as in us is, we will keep our reputation free of that little folly, which is nothing more than dead flies which cause you to stink. We want to be Christians that are wise. We want to be Christians that are held within honor. And this is just a little portion of scripture that is helping us to understand how we would do some things. Yes, some of the language there is a little bit um, cryptic, a little bit, uh, there's, there's language skills there. there there's different, different ways of personifying things that you don't see in all sorts of different English terms that I don't even understand because I was never an English major. But when you read it, you're seeing that he's explaining very simply that he, these dead flies got to keep them out of your life. Why? Because you're supposed to be somebody that is free of folly. You're supposed to be somebody that's wise and honorable and shows the way of God before men. 
And if you think that you're just going to do that in public, don't be surprised when God finds you cursing the king, when God finds you cursing the rich in your bedchamber, and he brings it to light by something like a little birdie that exposes you. This is what God does. This is the business that he does. Why? Because in the end, God wants us to not be people that are seeking to lift ourselves up as when we see the ruler taking great offense against us and coming at us with a lifted up spirit, or we see the ruler that we're under their authority doing great error, causing folly, lifting up with dignity those that are fools, setting the rich in low places, and doing all sorts of things that we don't agree with. There's sometimes where it's better for us to just trust God and let him get through us than try to enact our own will. And if we're always trying to act our own will, in the end we'll end up being that verse 20 where we're cursing the ruler. And when we're, we're speaking ill of the people that are rich, that are lording over us, that are ruling over us, and our folly is made manifest, and it just makes for a stinking, rotten, no-good testimony. It should not be so among Christians. 